Hi, very good afternoon to everyone. We have lagging problems. Your interpreter apologizes, we have lagging problems. And I would like then to tell you a little bit about what is the Latin American Caribbean Initiative for Carbon Market, which is known as ELAC. ELAC arose from all of those discussions that took place regarding the financing for climate change as an opportunity, as an important opportunity, which we saw from the CAF, the Latin American or rather the development bank for Latin America. As you well know, this is a voluntary which has had its ups and downs, but which has been growing in an important manner for the last few years, be it to come to fulfill commitments that the countries have adopted in the different climate summits, as well as for companies to be able to compensate carbon footprints. And in that manner, to stimulate the development of projects that may allow us to mitigate the effects of climate change through the reduction of our emissions of greenhouse gases emissions, yes. As uh, CAF, together with AIDE and the development banks for the region, we have 12 banks now associated to our initiative. We have started traveling down this path with a program that includes three components. One component for training, of which this webinar is part, and the other that we'll, well, we will know about now at the end of the year. In that training component, we will also be creating specialized courses on this topic. A second component, which with the generation of information through studies, we will be studying all of the components of the chain carbon market in order to identify the bottlenecks that do not allow Latin America to have a very relevant play. The third is information, the distri distribution, dissemination of information, whereby we will be generating mediums which we can share with you all relevant information about this topic. We will have an observatory. We will be issuing bulletins, news bulletins. We will have data information which you will be able to access. And we will constantly hold events and as a matter of fact, next year, we will hold our first ELAC Forum 2023. This initiative that as I have said, started off with the cooperation from the development banks of the region in bed to generate conditions so that we can improve the competitiveness of the carbon credits generated in Latin America and the Caribbean so that we can have a much more active participation in the voluntary carbon market. Today, we know that Latin America is the region with the greatest potential for generating projects that may mitigate the emission of greenhouse gases and therefore contribute to mitigate the effect of climate change. However, through the studies that we have undertaken, we understand that Latin participation is still low. So we need to work together in harmony in order to coordinate our efforts between countries and of the private players, as well as non-government players, so that this value chain can work in a much more agile manner and reduce the transaction costs, which are the ones that are somehow keeping Latin America from having a greater presence. 
And in that manner, we would generate all the so that in the middle and in the long range, we might have a Latin American carbon. So that Latin America and the Caribbean be a region with an important participation in this market, thus contributing contributing importantly to mitigate the effects of climate change. This, of course, will have a long -term effect on the economies upon improving the value chain for carbon. We are sure that we will be generating some instances in which we will be able to generate jobs to incorporate particular activities. And we will be able to generate a number of elements that are linked to the value chain that will bring income to the country, to private players, and therefore will contribute with the reduction of poverty in the region. Therefore, for us, it is a great honor to initiate this first webinar cycle, which we will be holding now and through December. During the second webinar, we will talk about how we develop projects and what is the process for application and registry. During the third webinar, we will touch on transparency, market, confirmation of price. The fourth webinar, we will delve deeper into the details as to how to structure those projects that are based on nature. And we will have one webinar dedicated to one of the sectors that could have a relevant potential for our, which is blue carbon or carbon generated with uh, projects linked to oceans, wetlands. So what we have for you is the good offer of knowledge and information that we hope we will all be able to take advantage of for the welfare of our region, for the welfare of our planet, and which regardless of the role that we may be filling each one of us in our we will be able to take advantage in order to incorporate these elements to our agenda for sustainability and to fight climate change. With this introduction, I would like to, first of all, welcome and thank for the participation. I want to thank all of our panelists today. We have Federico Vignatti, the Principal Executive of the Environment, Climate Change, and Biodiversity of CAF. We will also have the, the presence of Mr. Daniel Galvan, the Coordinator for the Regional Center for Cooperation or Collaboration for Central America from UN Climate Change. And we will have Mr. Carlos Linares, Executive Chair of COFIDE in Peru and Chair of ALIDE, which is the group that, the group that groups the development of the region. Okay, so without further ado, you know we have this presentation streaming in two languages, English and Spanish. So each one of you should have already selected your language of preference. And we will, have, at the end of all the, we will have a period of questions and answers that we will be responding in which you will, well, join us in YouTube. But without further ado, Federico Vignati will tell us about what the carbon market is and how it works. Federico, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gladys. Indeed, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you all. It's a great pleasure for me to have the honor and the opportunity of opening with this cycle of webinar, bringing this uh, basic explanation as to what the carbon market is and how does it work. The general objective of this presentation is that, well, besides familiarizing you with con basic concepts, it's uh, to awaken the sense of opportunity about this mechanism for financing or co-finance that's available and in which the Latin American region has an important position today. It is partially important today, but it will be expanded if we make the necessary adjustments and we create the necessary processes so that this will become an opportunity to leverage the social transformation, the economic transformation, and leverage the success of the projects that we have in Latin America with uh, contact with climate change. So in order to begin, we should understand that when we talk about carbon credit, we are talking about a certificate that is associated to the removal, the idea of removing 
or reducing one ton of carbon. When you talk about carbon credit, the credit is associated to the figure of one ton. The general objective is in every case that this carbon credit should put into perspective the benefit or the climatic survey that uh, which will eventually it will be ecosystemic and it will be ecological. It is a climatic benefit that a project may offer. In many activities or processes or projects, they have climate effect on the climate. The thing is that we had never put assigned a value to it. And the carbon credit, what it does is assign a value to it. It recognizes this positive impact on the climate that a project can have. The goal in the end is that this credit should generate a flow of additional financing, co-financing, which will allow from a point of view or well, depending on the circumstances of the particular project, it will make it feasible. It could be fundamental or eventually to replicate it or to scale it up. So we are talking about carbon credits. We are talking about one ton. We are talking about a mechanism for co-financing, which assigns a value to the positive effects on the climate that some projects will have. When we talk about the market, then we are talking about two markets, the regulated market and then the, volun the voluntary market. Now, what leads association seek carbon credits within the framework of a regulated market or a voluntary market goes through what we can call the motivation the motivator or the generating factor it could be a matter of leadership when it is leadership it is possible that the offer is more associated to the voluntary market but when we talk about compliance and when we talk about compliance, we're talking about some type of regulation or standard, or eventually it could be an incentive or even a tax that a company might have to cover. And then it would be used as a manner of resolving the compensation with carbon credits in the regulated or the voluntary markets. About carbon credits about the nature of carbon credits. The market for carbon credits is formed basically by two larger categories, which are then grouped into four alternatives. In general, we have the credits for mitigation, which are those that avoid or reduce the, the carbon. Let's, let's say a large solar project has a direct impact on reducing carbon emissions as compared to a proposal of standard energy generation in a, some place. It is possible that the solar proposal will be more efficient. Now, that difference between the baseline the standard of that operation and the possibility of generating energy, that difference allows us to generate or to assign a value to that positive impact on the climate. And through that, you could generate a specific number of carbon credits. Now, when we talk about credits for removal, we are talking about credits associated more to the management of the capture of carbon from atmosphere. This happens mostly, we know that this is the main technology, the main tool, the main solution in the planet for removing is a natural removal. Removal offered by the natural services, the ecosystem. One very evident example is the growth of trees. But there are some other less evident examples. For instance, the carbon capture that takes place in the oceans, phytoplankton. But the issue in general is that there are some natural solutions, which is where Latin America has a tremendous comparative advantage. And it is what makes us think 
that working with natural climatic solutions is an important opportunity to be able to bolster positioning for Latin America as a large provider. In the topic of reduction, there is also a very important opportunity for Latin America, but it turns out that our region is a great generator. The energy matrix in our region is pretty clean by now. So there is still a, a margin of action which is slightly less than in other places where the matrix, the baseline, the current reference is not that clean. However, there is a great space because of the great natural capital that we have in our region in order to turn Latin America and the Caribbean into a, an important provider of solutions associated to the ecological restoration to the forest space as a conservation of forests, the capture of carbon in agricultural lands and so on. And of course, today we're also living in an important process of innovation whereby we're applying technology in order to capture carbon. In oil companies, you already can see, even in cement production, you see how we capture carbon in the or even filter air in order to use it for industrial use. And all of that can be co financed through carbon credits. This graph is quite interesting because if we see, this is a graph that I would love you to take a look at two colors, in spite of the fact that there are three or four. One is mainly gray and the other one is mostly green. If we see that this started in 2010 and we see the curve here up until 2021, we will mainly see that the presence of green is marginal. However, when we get to 2016, we go all the way to 2020, how do we see the important increase of the offer of carbon credits associated precisely to the type of market where Latin America has a comparative advantage and the Caribbean, it also has a significant comparative advantage. These are the solutions based on nature or the climatic is age. This over here, we could think that it is something that fills us with enthusiasm with relation to the group of opportunities that this simple graph can convey to us. If this trend continues because Latin America manages to fill out the key aspects in order to have an important carbon credit offer that it may be it may may have the credibility required in a in a market that is maturing and it is more demanding and it, it understands the strong points and the weaknesses of carbon credits in general then everyone will have a good advantage and like the other case it will also have some weaknesses that need be managed such as integrity, the alignment in processes for monitoring and evaluation, the universalization of the practices for monitoring for these projects in a manner that we may understand them in a standard manner so that there will be no process that will still not be talking to each other and which confuse the market. These things that are present, but they can be worked on. And of course, if you you analyze that there is an important demand and that the region of Latin America and the Caribbean have the condition to be able to occupy a huge space in this global challenge posed by seeking, by living in a society where carbon emissions do not accompany the economic growth, but on the contrary, that the prosperity that we seek will be a catalyzing agent from the reduction of carbon through green businesses. That is where we should be going. That is where we are aiming. And that is the great energy and enthusiasm that moves us, if you allow me to say so. If we take a look one way or another, take a look at the standards. What we have in general is that there are five standards out of which two are associated to international mechanisms linked to negotiations uh, in the environment of the United Nations and which are the mechanisms that have generated the greatest 
offer in carbon credits as well as greater demand for carbon credits as of the moment that this mechanism started working at the end of the 90s. However, there are some other standard typologies that, well, some that come from this first government at the early in the, the noughties in the year 2000, and some others that are gaining space like alternatives because the market is changing. The market is demanding more speed, more efficiency. It is demanding that the standards should be able to accompany the large challenges of our times. And naturally, there is space and many opportunities to occupy a space with solutions that may be soft, transparent, which will grant legitimacy to all of the efforts for compensation that the companies are seeking, and which, on the other hand, can contribute so that projects of different types, different sizes, with different dimensions, can also gain benefit from this co-financing, which is no less and no more than the recognition of an environmental service provided by a, a project, and which today, or rather traditionally, though were not recognized. And of course, in order to be recognized, you have to go through this huge curve of uh, certification, which covers the standards that allow us to generate these carbon credits. All right, so it turns out that for us, well, why carbon credits market with the weaknesses, trends, and importance, important points? And with its questions, because in the end, what we need to push is for a transformation, a structural transformation of our matrix. We have to avoid, ideally, we have to avoid emitting greenhouse gases. But this is not something that comes from, from a small reflection. This mechanism of carbon credits is part of a great combination of efforts. This is not the effort, it is a combination of efforts. And within this combination of efforts, this group of efforts that we as mankind, humankind, as society, that we need to push forth, we have this tool, carbon credit. It's one of those. So it turns out that with regard diverse analysis that have been performed. The great challenge, the challenge that represents 90% of our effort should be to avoid, no, to avoid emitting carbon. But in spite, even if we avoid emitting this 90% of necessary reduction in order to reach this challenge of staying within one and a half degrees of increase of the temperature, the atmospheric temperature, for this, there would be a need to have at least a 10% of mitigation, at least 10% which will have a cat, an enormous catalytic effect with bringing about other sorts of solutions because they walk hand in hand. This 10%, my friends, would represent an, a reduction, an increase of 15 times of the size of the carbon market existing today. Based on 2019, 2020, 15 times greater size of the market to occupy a portion position of 10% in this great global effort where we have as a milestone the reduction of minus 23 gigatons. This strategic goal for sustainability and for human permanence as we know it until 2050. To close, I would like to share with you that based on the studies undertaken in the uh, Latin American Initiative for Carbon, we have identified that our region has some comparative advantages, I have already said that, but it also has some pending, pending tasks. Precisely among these pending tasks, it is that ELAC pretends to have a qualitative contribution in order to help the region and everything that is involved in this global value chain should be positive for this great transformation. I'm not going to analyze all of this because we are short on time, but I am absolutely dying to hear all of your questions. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Federico. Very well. We have seen a very important and clear mapping as to what the carbon market is. Now, let us take a look at the regulatory framework behind this carbon market and how it has been evolving over time. And for that purpose, Daniel Galvan will take the floor. He is the coordinator for the Regional Center for for Latin America of the United Nations of Climate Change. Daniel, it's a pleasure to have you first. first. Thank you, Gladys. And thank you, thank you, and thank you, Federico, for that uh, ILAC initiative for inviting the, the Regional Center for Collaboration and Climate Change uh, to cooperate in this series of workshops. Uh, allow me to share my screen with a presentation. Please give me a second. Yes, I am very, could you please confirm that you can see? Yes, we can see. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. All right, thank you. So as they said during the introduction, it is my turn to, uh, to tell you about the regulatory framework of the carbon market at the global level. I would like to give you a little bit of context as to how the Latin American countries have gotten to, well, it's not only Latin America, America, all the countries have now arrived at this text that were agreed on the COP26. It was Article of Stick of Markets and Non Markets because it turns out that there's a huge history behind all of this with great experience achieved in Latin America above all. And I would like to start by telling you about how the country started getting involved on the topics of climate change, but also in the topics of carbon. Very quickly, I want to tell you about the Framework Convention on Climate Change. It is one of the three Rio conventions adopted in 1992 and which entered into effect in 1994. They have over 190 countries registered and it was the beginning at which the countries, well, they started taking on the topic of climate change as a topic that was important for their development agendas, one of the great milestones of the convention was the Kyoto Protocol. Probably everyone watching this webinar already knows about this, but still I would like to remind you, the Kyoto Protocol, which was signed in 1997 and entered into force in, in, in February in 2005, when Russia finally ratified it and we got the number of countries that we needed, it had a very specific objective, which was to reduce emissions, but it was emissions at a global level, the greenhouse gases, but it was only to a certain number of countries which were the developed countries. The Kyoto Protocol has this distinction of common responsibilities, but then differentiated by a certain number of countries that committed to these reductions. Another great achievement of the Kyoto Protocol was, the, was that it developed the basis for the clean development goals mentioned by Federico, joint implementation, which, well, we, did not see this in the region because it was a system for reduction of emissions between developed countries and then also the international trade of emissions. Now, what we did see in our region was the clean development mechanism, which at the global level registered over 8,000 projects. And it was basically Asia Pacific, the one that registered the greatest amount of projects. Then we had Latin America and also Africa, which a very small percentage. Well, uh, this is just adding to what the previous presentation already told us. The majority of the projects for clean development were energy projects. As you can see here, it was hydroelectric plants, the ones that were registered the most. We also found some wind power, some were landfills, 
biomass there were at, there were at different uh, categories in latin america the countries that registered the most projects were were brazil mexico then chile but well in general almost every single country in latin america registered a good amount of projects and many of these projects achieved implementation and verified the reduction of as we know there was a fall in the demand as of 2012 for certifications and that was when the clean development mechanism was also used for other goals as was a carbon neutral in a voluntary manner in the clean development mechanism well there were or there is a cycle of projects which went from drafting a project document which was approved at the level of a country and which would then go to a number of revisions before being implemented there was validation by a registering company which was recognized by UN climate change the project would be implemented and once it was implemented it, they would go through their monitoring plan then they would quantify reductions included in the monitoring evidently after some verification they would issue the reductions the mdl the clean development mechanism gave the region a lot of recognition there was a lot of financing achieved thanks to this mechanism. And well, we also transferred. Either. There was a period between the end of It was at the beginning of the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement, and at that point, some countries started developing different initiatives for fixing prices on carbon. Many of them had the support of the World Bank and developed the system for trading emissions, or rather the basis of that system, and also carbon taxes. And perhaps the most important thing here was that Mexico started with the uh, emissions trading system, which was a voluntary system and which has already completed its testing stages. And we expect that very soon they will start with their stages as, as it's operating as stipulated in the climate change law of Mexico. Other countries such as China, which has generated seven trade and emissions and they're trying to unify them that will be the the largest system for trades and emissions in the planet on planet. finally it was the european union uh, whose 27 members generated a system for trade and emissions which has had three stages the first stage was 2005 through 2007. The second one was the 08 through 12, which coincided with the commitment of the first period of the Kyoto Protocol. And now in the era of the Paris Agreement of 2020 and through 2030, they continue to operate that system. In our region, we also take place in other initiatives. For instance, in 2017, they lost, they launched the initiative for carbon pricing in the Americas. That initiative, the spirit of that initiative initially was to connect the emissions center that were being generated in Mexico, Chile, and Colombia. And well, it is has changed and has become more aligned to support implementation of Article 6 of the Paris. It is basically focused on the government. 
then, well, we enter the era of the Paris Agreement and here, different to the Kyoto Protocol, all countries have, let's say they are compelled to reduce their riches depending on their possibilities. And they report this through the national contributions. And these contributions, well, these documents have been presented to the convention and they have developed a number of synthesis reports where they have identified that there are over 10 countries in Latin America that are thinking of using the carbon markets to, to meet their goals. Now, I would like to remind you that what has been developed up to now in project, at least in the clean development mechanism, let's say 95% of the projects have been developed by the private sector. And that is why it is necessary that now that we are in this new era of the Paris Accord, we can support the private sector so that they will gain that technical capacity, that access to financing and technology. And so that they may participate in the development of projects. And as you were saying, most projects were energy projects in spite of the fact that within the very clean development mechanism it was possible to generate reduction in projects with conservation reforestation etc and so let us say that somehow as federico was saying we wasted the opportunity and well we hope that under article 6 we will be able to it will be an opportunity for our Article 6 was adopted uh, at COP26 last year, so it came from 2015 all the way until last year in order to have an agreement on the rules. We from the regional office generated a manual for the negotiators, which has a lot of information regarding what we are presenting now and the experience that the, the region has, not only with the MDL, but also voluntary mechanisms and the initiatives that existed and which are still in force. Now, about Article 6, what is it? They adopted three texts. The first, Article 6.2, which is the call for cooperative focus. Under this mechanism, the, company, the countries have the possibility of cooperating with other countries in order to exchange the reductions in projects of different sectors, which, which as they may agree in conventions or agreements. Now, the more representative initiative that we have heard about in agreement with what we've signed with, where they are seeking to identify different projects and programs that a generate reduction so that Swedish government will meet its commitments on the Paris Accord. Very, very, to, very interesting to mention. There are other mechanisms in the region, like the ones that Federico mentioned, and which will grant us the opportunities to be the mechanism to validate, to verify, to register the reductions in the emissions. This is something that was not included in the Kyoto Protocol. In mechanism, actually article 6.4, this is kind of the continuation or it is what is expected of the clean development mechanism. And this one will be governed by the International Convention on Climate Change and And under this mechanism, the convention will be providing support to the country so that they can implement institutional agreements for capacity building, which will also be good to develop the mechanism. And finally, we have Article 6.8. This is the one that we know as the mechanism for rather non-market. And up to now, we have developed a work plan and we have been asking for some contributions from the country 
from the countries in order to have their comments about what initiatives could join point eight. We are first, we are involved in the circular market and there are topics like that that could be recognized, but this will be reviewed over the COP27 and we will have a bit more guideline about that. This chart, I'm going to leave it here in the presentation because it brings about the differentiation of all three mechanisms. All mechanisms in the countries are participating voluntarily. What we seek is to increase the participation of the SMSs, Sustainable Development Goals, yes, so that they will participate in such projects and it be projects that have environmental integrity. Well, I did mention earlier that there is a difference that in the point two, the countries take a little bit more of empowerment because they perform the supervision of all of the project cycle, whereas the 6.4, the convention provides that service of being able to put at, uh, make available to the entities that have been credited as verifying entities and also the possible assessment of the project with the convention and then a process for registry of emissions. And 6.8, as I had said, for this webinar, perhaps it does not have that much relevance because it is not focused to markets. Now, what are we doing from the convention and together with ILAC and CAF? All right, we have a mandate different to when the, the clean development mechanism started, there were no funds. Well, now we do have funds. There is a mandate to support the countries in implementing institutional arrangements and in being able to have the technical capacity so that they can operate 6.4 and 6.2. And this is a good compliment to what I like to say because we are working regarding Well, it is the private financing mechanisms, but it is also necessary for the government to have the capacity in order to process all of these projects and manage these voluntary markets as well as the regulated markets. As I was saying, we will have a number of training workshops. Now we have put together a program that will be presented before the COP once we have it. And as a matter of fact, once we have it, we will present it before the CAF as well in order to identify those opportunities for joint cooperation in the next training workshops. Here, I would also like to leave a slide with the cycle of the project, because as I was mentioning, it is important to mention that the countries will have a greater role now, more important role in being able to manage these carbon projects and carbon markets, because it will not only be at the beginning when projects are approved for implementation, but also with use of the certification of the reduction of the certification for reduction, the countries will have to decide whether they certify these certifications for voluntary use or perhaps some other agreements like Porsa, which is more about aviation. And that is where we will be also providing support to the countries. Headed to the COP, Conference of the Parties. Well, we still need the detailed rules of the 6.4 and some from the 6.2 as well for the approval of these uh, programs for development of capacities. And it is quite important to mention that the supervising body for 6.4 already held its first meeting. At this first meeting, besides the projects for reduction of emissions, there was a public no conceptual note and I will include the link, which also speaks to the opportunities for Project for 
CO2 capture. So they are also mobilizing the participation and we hope that on this occasion, Latin America will have greater participation in this. Very well, this is a general and very quick screenshot as how the countries have gotten all the way to this point with the carbon markets. And if you want to hear more about Article 6 or about any other topic regarding the fixing of the price fixing for carbon credits, well, I am available to you. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you, Gladys. Thank you, Daniel. Really excellent presentation because you have made this very brief summary of a number of topics that have been debated for years between different players, including public and private players in the different countries. Now, our third presentation, it is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Carlos Linares, the executive director of COFIDE in Peru. He also has the chair of ALIDE, the Association of Development Banks or Financial Institutions for Development. And we would like him to tell us how a development bank sees this, these issues in their sustainability agenda which we know Kofide has one good one. Thank you, Mr. Linares, for joining us today. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, first of all, I want to express my gratitude for this invitation from, Cla from CAF, this webinar presentation. I will allow myself to share my screen. And you tell me, please, when you do see it. Can you see it? Yes, it's still in... You have to put it into presentation format so that it will be full screen. There you go. That's it. Perfect. Yes. Well, first of all, uh, my greetings and congratulations to CAF for this initiative. We do share this idea. We are in full agreement in the sharing that launch that we had during the launch of Alide. And well, thank you again for this invitation. Um, let us take a quick view uh, of the perspective of the development banks and how the banks can contribute to building and developing the carbon markets in each of our countries, which is uh, an element that as, as you can see from the previous presentations, this has become indispensable to make resources available in order to make some projects feasible, particularly for private investment, to projects that may generate these carbon bonds. These are the expression of this reduction of CO2 emissions. As has been said, the world has agreed that climate change is a real threat. We have seen year after year how climate events are affecting us. As a matter of fact, our region is one of the most exposed regions to the effects of climate change. But at the same time, we are one of the regions with the greatest amount of possibilities for generating these carbon bonds due to the biodiversity that we have in our countries. They, it is estimated that there are need of over $28 billion up until 2030 to, to have the investments that will allow us to reach the goals. And the regulated carbon markets can offer an opportunity to harmonize investment. The countries that have signed the Paris, the Paris Accord have commitments to reaching these reductions. And in as much as it is true, the public investment will contribute, but what we need great amounts of is private investment. But that is why the public sector also has to do its job beyond regulation and facilitating infrastructure that will allow us to make feasible this private investment that will allow us in turn to attain these goals regarding the reduction of the green. Yeah. 
This is a graph regarding the evolution of the prices of the global index on carbon. And as has been already said from the very beginning, it has had, they have had kind of a slow evolution at the beginning, but in the last few years, as a consequence of these commitments that the countries have now agreed to, and with more awareness regarding the importance of the reduction of greenhouse gases, it has been a, a quite a jump for the last few years. However, this is not fully taken advantage of by our countries, particularly in the region, because we do not have established mechanisms to be able to optimize the sale of carbon credits. So from that perspective, I believe that the development banks have an important role to play in contributing to drive the regulatory frameworks that may aid in the creation of these markets in order for us to have greater clarity for private investors regarding the rules with which they can place their investment. And as a development bank, we have that, that ability to bring together. We can be facilitated between the public and private sectors to be able to work jointly and facilitate this development. As development bank, I believe that we can take some examples and these will be related to the case of countries as were mentioned like Brazil, Mexico, Chile, which also have a greater degree of, of progress in compare, regarding the, the progression, the regulation for this type of investment. Other countries are probably lagging behind, but it is the moment, the right moment now to, to give a push in order to facilitate the flows of a private investment to achieve positive effects in, in adaptation to climate change. And many of the development banks have been incorporating into our purposes in, in our mission and vision. We have been bringing in these concepts about sustainability under criteria, ESG, right? Which is a social environmental responsibility as well as economic responsibility. So these are concepts such as sustainability, which are in, now incorporated in the purpose, the mission, and the vision of the development banks. Also, our strategic objectives are aligned with the ODSs, the Sustainable Development Goals, yes, and the regulatory framework and the policy for sustainability of each country. So we have to be transparent and coherent in that alignment between the institutional objectives as development banks and the strategic objectives of the country and then the sustainable development goals of the nations. I will go quickly through the structure of the products that we have in the financial offer. Above all, the type of finance that we offer for projects that may have a positive impact on climate change. And in our case in COFIDE, we have been working for instance with multilateral organizations and government agencies to, for programs that may support this type of investment. For about 10 years already, COFIDE again played an important role in the financing for infrastructure projects and with great emphasis on renewable energies. In the period of 2022, COFIDE financed approximately $680 million, which represented 27% of financing for projects. It was mostly for hydroelectric plants and wind farms and solar farms. In the pipeline, we also have, over the next years, we have these types of projects continue to have 
an important relevance. And precisely due to the geographic conditions of our countries for the case of wind farms as well as solar farms. We have also been developing green lines. As we said, multilateral partners such as the IAP or agencies of the government. For instance, we're developing a program for businesses in the Peruvian Amazon to, to finance projects for life economy. Also with the IADB a program for electromobility stimulating investment in sustainable solutions, particularly in transportation with KFW and BEI, we have financing for the green reactivation for climatic action projects. And the important thing is that they all come with technical assistance, some other resource that will facilitate the financing for the different agents, the stakeholders are important to attract this type of market and to be able to facilitate these investments. And we are in a process of accreditation for the Green Fund for the Climate, Green Climate Fund rather. We have a forest project in Peru where due to geographic conditions, it is a sector with a great deal of potential. This will also allow me to generate important reductions of greenhouse gas. On the other hand, we have also been developing the issuance of some bonds. We have issued green bonds. Two of these have been offered locally. We have sustainable bonds with a social component and social bond, which we also offered as of last year. We have also been developing partnerships with groups and agencies for the promotion of projects of impact. There is a project to create a national council for projects with impact for the uh, offering financing for private sector in order to promote investments for impact in the country, impact in the country. And for this, logically, inside our organizations, we have been working to adapt ourselves to the internal processes and the capacities for an appropriate environmental and social management. We have developed a new SARAS for the system for the administration of environmental and social risks so that we can manage those risks and to be able to facilitate investment into these markets. And these are standards that every time our different sources demand this is another task that we have to offer this knowledge in support of the local financial institutions and that the local market will be in a position to take advantage of these opportunities of financing. And here again, our connection in order to facilitate between and communication and cooperation between the public and private sectors in order to develop the necessary elements regarding regulations, installations, infrastructure that will allow us to drive that kind of investment. All of this effort that we have been undertaking has had recognition in the local market. We have been named a socially responsible company. It was uh, last year in Peru. And this is a reward for those efforts based on all of the work that we have been performing with regards to the incorporation of the concepts of sustainability 
at, in the, at the core of the institution, we have been measuring our carbon footprint and neutralizing the effect that the effect that we had we didn't know how to translate because it is a carbon neutral company and we have some services and in magnitude probably it's small what we generate with regards to emissions but I believe that it is important to have coherence and to give an example before the market. And these carbon bonds we have acquired in order to, to, uh, to work with natural reserves and community groups. And native groups which for instance, this conservation of forests also allows us to generate these carbon bonds. We have acquired some of these, but due to a topic of measurement, which is another important topic in the hands of the environmental ministry, it had suspended the project last year. They have still bonds, we are going through the methodologies in order to measure the tendency towards deforestation, which is what this type of organization allows. We can measure the savings in what greenhouse effect gases by conserving forest versus the deforestation that would have taken place if there was no conservation. And well, I believe this was also mentioned in the previous presentation, the degree of development of the carbon market inside our countries varies a great deal. They have already mentioned the cases of Mexico, Brazil, Chile, as the ones that have a greater degree of development. But the initiative from CAF, supported by AIDE, to try to homogenize, train the different entities in each one of the countries in order to facilitate the development of these markets, that will all be important. And COFIDE and ALIDE are both contributing with those initiatives, we want to allow our countries to take advantage of that potential we have for developing investments that may allow the generation of these carbon bonds. Well, basically it is an example of what COFI has, in particular in those countries that we mentioned, Brazil, where you have the NDS, which have products and mechanisms no, that, way, that have facilities for this type of financing to negotiate carbon market and carbon bonds. I believe the development can play an important role in facilitating through mechanisms and advisory, the negotiation of these carbon bonds and the investments or projects of nature, which can develop, generate benefits. So I will stop at this point and I am available for any question. Thank you. And thank you very much, Carlos. It is a very complete agenda with which we can interact and uh, use it importantly for the welfare of the region. So now we have some space for questions and I have been receiving a number of questions for the chat. Now, before the questions, I would like to read a comment 
uh, extended by Camilo Rojas, former officer of CAF, and today he's a consultant climate change and energy. And he says, uh, as per analysis of voluntary um, uh, research, there has been a total of 70% of financing at the end of 2020. This is a great Latin America, but we need to be careful with the topic of additionality of renewable energies because due to the ten, due to the trend of the increase in the cost of the installation of wind and solar powers, they could lose their additionality. Being it so, it is worthwhile to add support to these um, types of investment with lateral uh, response from the ODS. This was a comment from our former com uh, comrade Camilo. Uh, and maybe you want to add that. But otherwise, I will go straight to the questions. There is a question that I believe is for Federico because it is along the lines of which, uh, and the question is, what is the difference between mitigation and removal? No, you see, the thing is that there is no difference financially, economically, there is no difference. It is a difference in, term of, in terms of project profile. There are simply some economic sectors, economic activities in the general economic sector where some private initiatives, eventually public, private, the society does conservation as may be the case, in which nature of the project is mitigation and others are of a nature of what they plan to do is well to remove or to avoid emissions. In both cases, you mitigate, but there is no economic difference. Not necessarily, no. All right. How do we counter the volatility of the price of carbon? Have you thought of previous consultation, a free informed consultation for the prices? Daniel, maybe you want to take that question? Um, thank you for the question. I think that in the future, this is maybe a personal opinion, countries should fix what will be the price of the ton of CO2 based on the country's context, the cost of abatement, uh, the commitments within the NDC. I'm not talking about a tax on CO2, I'm just saying that countries should have an analysis depending on each sector, depending on these costs of abate and what could be the price per ton of CO2. And it should be, let us say a price, well, this is the, a more personal opinion in that they would be able to promote within the country more projects, but also to be able to commercialize these reductions. I don't know whether they have a health problem because up to now, there has been no mechanism to be able to fix these prices. And well, we saw this with the MDL. Yes, this affected uh, Latin America a great deal. Okay, and on the on the, about the prices, we will invite you to the third webinar for so that you can learn more about the market. I have a question for Mr. Carlos Linares. The financing offered by COFIDE for projects that contribute to mitigating climate change, do they have any type of preferential treatment or are they simply focused on those projects and do not finance those that do not contribute? Um, we incorporated a few years ago the principles for management, the ESG, the social, yes, and the, the type of impact that projects would cover, environmental, social, and economic, of course. So, yes, definitely we would not finance a project that does not contribute or, or at least to be neutral. You know, we would not we would not find us one that has a negative effect on climate change. Now, 
on the side, on the positive side, the lines that we have for financing projects that have a positive impact are long-term uh, lines of credit and with competitive Excellent. Federico, there is a list of approved species for restoration or reforestation aimed at the sale of carbon credits. Um, no, there is none. The fact that generates them is the activity of the restoration. It should be ecological within the framework of ecosystem or it in mono crop due to classic forestry business. There is no list. What does exist naturally is that depending on the species, the species do have different capacities throughout their life cycle to catch carbon, to capture carbon. Obviously, there are some species that will have a greater impact, a greater capacity for capture, and the, those will be able to generate, a, the, gener the project will be more attractive from that standpoint. Great. Thank you. Daniel, I think this is more of your personal opinion. Somebody has asked, how can you drive the carbon markets in Latin America in those places where there are none? And thank you for that question as well. Um, what some countries are doing, and it was mentioned by Dr. Linares, there are these voluntary voluntary ad, ad initiative for measuring the carbon footprint. And through several different levels, they can measure, they can reduce, they can compensate. So at the time that those programs are voluntary, then the participants, the countries, have a little more of an opportunity to take a look at the benefits and these can be transformed in the future. They can be turned into a national market for emissions. One thing that we have to take into consideration is the time that it has taken China or Mexico to reach the stages at which they are now. The climate law from Mexico is from 2012, and it was only this year that they are completing their pilot test. So the emergency of uh, climate change, the urgency of climate change tells us that we need to look way beyond these uh, footprint systems perhaps go more more quickly towards voluntary markets than uh, and regulated markets. Thank you. And we have several questions, but these are kind of similar. So I will group one. And it is like, uh, what is the role of non-government organizations or foundations, etc., that may be linked to project or a forest in order to execute projects and participate in the market. I don't know whether Federico would like to take that one. That one, that one is kind of complicated, but okay, let me try. The thing is that traditionally, non-government organizations and civil society, well, they have played a very important role transferring capacity. So it is indeed possible that these organizations could contribute with a transfer of certain necessary capacities so that in the case of there being public-private relations and with communities, there will be some mechanisms where they, there will be equity or equality rather in the participation and there will be a fair distribution of benefits where there will be comprehension of the roles and responsibilities and where there will be some kind of concerted agreement that will allow all this to work efficiently, bearing in mind that the cycles for initiating carbon projects have a certain degree of complexity and can take important time. And that due to all of those reasons, an organization of this nature would sell, would, would catalyze this uh, process so that it will be more efficient and that it will have better impact for everyone. Great, great. One more question. It says, what are the standards that have been applied 
in the measurement of the reduction of carbon emissions and do these assessments, if these evaluations, are they consistent with the data from impact? Daniel, what has been the experience that you've seen? Yes, well, even from the convention, we supervise not only the clean development mechanism, but also from the regional office, we are very close to other mechanisms or rather other voluntary schemes and they use very similar methodologies and they are all based on the IPCC methodology with similar emissions factors. So the project cycle, the validation, verification, they are all very similar. So it is simply that now there are more options for participants who want to develop projects. But these are very similar. The standards are very similar in the end. Okay, a question for Dr. Carlos Linares. Dr. Linares, how have you seen from the standpoint of your customers, what is the receptive, what, how receptive are they to this type of products, you know, projects for mitigation of climate change? Sufficient offer? Well, I believe that the potential for projects at least in the electric sector is quite high. Above all, renewable energy projects due to the geographic conditions of the country, but also sectors with a great deal of potential that is still, it's only beginning like the forestry sector so I believe that their interest, yes, they, those conditions are bringing some of these projects forward. And the task remains, the task that remains is a need due to our country's needs to be able to reach the objectives that have been agreed to on the Paris, on the Paris Accord to mobilize private investment in order to have the possibility of reaching them through new investments. So we think that, yes, this will little by little come about with specific projects. And we hope that as COFIDE, we will also be able to support financing for renewable energies, for forest sector, or even financing or rather supporting financing of non-government organizations that have been performing important work in the conservation of forests and nature in general in different regions of different countries. Excellent, because that also is an addition to the answers given to the NGOs and foundations so they can have an ally in Kofide. I have a question for Daniel. What results are expected from the pilot program of Article 6 between Peru and Switzerland? Any other pilots in Latin America? Um, no, up to now we have not heard of any other pilot projects. We held a meeting with the organization which has been recognized by from Switzerland. It was in June here in Bonn. And they have more projects, but these are in Africa. And then from the regional office, what we will do is to promote in order to search other bilateral agreements with other governments. So, and what could we expect? Okay, we could expect that obviously the countries that seek or that sign these agreements are looking for access to financing, access to technology, capacity building. I understand that some countries, although other countries that are signing this type of agreements in other regions are promising to establish the whole system or the infrastructure for the registry and transfer of reductions and that they will connect with the registries from other countries in Europe and as well as other regions. 
So in terms of reduction, they are defining the type of project still somewhere out there. They put some sectors, but it is still not properly defined, nor is it defined what number of reductions, what amount in reduction they expect. I think that will all come together in the second stage when they have a mapping of the opportunities in the countries. And that is kind of the situation, but there are no other bilateral agreements at this time. Now, what we will see is that we will probably see some bilateral agreements, probably not, not only with the European countries, but maybe like Mexico and Panama or Panama and Peru. It will not only be developed countries, to developing countries, but also between Latin America. Uh, thank you, and thank you. I have another question for Dr. Carlos Linares about the three topics of bonds that you mentioned that you have already issued. Are these bonds that credit greenhouse gases? What is your relationship? What, what is that relationship with the carbon market? In the case of the green bond, which is related to projects, that have a positive impact on the environment, that green fund we contributed to the financing for energy, is solar energy rather. So yes, if they can, yes, there is a direct relationship with the emission of the carbon bonds because the one that issues the bonds is the sponsor of the project. So contributing to the financing of that project makes it that it will be possible to get those carbon bonds, which is a additional component to the financing of the project. Now, indirectly, it will contribute to uh, avoid the generation of CO2. Very good. Okay, this question, well, I'm going to throw at Federico because I think this is what we want with ILAC. So that the, you, you are bolstering the unification of criteria before projects together with other agencies? Yes, together and through as well. There is a mechanism, there is a value chain that has a that is kind of structured already and it ha even has some legitimacy and which from the standpoint of latin america and the caribbean our mission our vision is to drive the competitiveness of this offer generated in the environment of these projects that already exist and we want to leverage and force capacities in the environment of the key players which are elements which are operational elements and catalytic purposes for the creation of carbon credits. Perfect. One question for Daniel. What are the expectations that you have with COP27 in the carbon market? I know that you did speak to perfecting the Article 6.4, but you as an office, what do you expect? What, what do you think you will have at the end of the meeting? Any specific result? Um, yes, we expect that the rules regarding, for instance, the type of project that will be registered under the 6.4, 6.2, that will be important because with that, we will be able to define the type of support that we will get in the region. And surely they will start, the organizations that will participate in 6.2 as well as the government, they will start operating these mechanisms and then we will start seeing this generation of projects as were seen in 2005 with the clean, um, development mechanism. So these are these opportunities to see these movements in the projects. Okay, there is one question here about the forestry sector. I don't know, I guess Federico and maybe you can add 
you or Dr. Linares, do you know any, any experience on legal frameworks on the property of carbon and the dissemination of benefits for the project for reduction? Okay, yes. In the framework of the forestry business as such, in what classic perspective of a forest business, it happens like in any other cycle project, it goes through the review of the ownership of the land. We start off from the principle that the investment is supported by the right to the property. And depending on the country, the land ownership of the ecosystemic service, that in that case, it's carbon capture. It can be the owner of the private company as well as the state. So there is no single answer. I could tell you that in the case of Peru, it is managed in one manner. In the case of Bolivia and Ecuador, it's two different other ones. It's more with the state. In the case of Peru and other countries, for instance, Colombia, the right for the exploration of carbon is private. All right, excellent. I have no further questions. I don't know if you would, each one of you would like to share with us some closing remarks. We have three more minutes to close the event. And let's start with Dr. Linares. Thank you, Gladys. I think that something that is evident after these conversations, these presentations that we've heard, that the task that we have ahead of us is quite large and time is running and it is short. The kind of commitment that the countries have been accepting and the efforts that we need to undertake in order to reach these productions, it is very important. And as the role, as, as a development bank we are, we play a strategic role in trying to accelerate these processes both for the public and the private sector. Excellent, Daniel. First of all, I want to thank CAF for this opportunity of collaborating in this initiative. And uh, well, I want to invite everyone to please continue. Continue with the activities of the COP27, follow what's going on. We expect to come back with news regarding agreements from the countries in the future webinars that CAF put together. Uh -huh. Now you're committed to appear again. There you are, Federico. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. I want to thank my colleagues, panelists, Carlos, Daniel. And thank you, Gladys, for being our dear moderator. And I want to invite you to accompany this Latin American initiative, Latin American mm -hmm. Caribbean initiative for carbon. We have a beautiful work. It is already underway. And we hope and expect that the publications will be of your interest and will be useful to you. Thank you all so much. All right. Without further ado, please stay abreast of our news. We will be inviting you to the next webinars. We want all to know a lot more about these topics so that we can push them from our different places of work and our activities. And this webinar of today has been recorded. It will be posted on the CAF website. If you go into the site where it says events, where you registered in order to register for this webinar, you will see the recording there. Soon, we will have a micro site dedicated to ILAC. It will be there too. You will be able to listen to it all over again. And we will have all of the presentations available to you so that those who did not have the opportunity to see it, you will be able to do so then. All right, so thank you all very much for joining us today and for allowing us this space of your time to share this information. Thank you to all of our excellent panelists and thank you to everyone who participated. So long. Bye-bye.